Welcome to the Weather Report. Today I'm here with Peter the Byzantine, and he's going to give us an introduction to Byzantine Catholicism. So Peter, would you like to introduce us? And sure. Hello everyone. Uh, today we're going to talk about, uh, a little bit about uh, Byzantine Catholicism, which is uh, really, really interesting for, for me. Um, I, w I was raised in it. I was baptized uh, Byzantine Catholic. And it's only been uh, recently where I've been more interested in the faith of Byzantine Catholicism. Um, you know, a lot of people will say that if you're Catholic, that means that you're Roman, which is not the case. Um, Byzantine Catholicism is the second largest uh, sect in Catholicism. And the most interesting thing is that there's actually 26 different types of Catholic, of Catholic sects. The largest is being Roman, um, being Roman Catholics, and then you have the Byzantine, and then it just goes, you know, down forward. But with um, Byzantine Catholicism, uh, a little bit of the history here. It came from. You know, where did we get the name, Byz you know, Byzantine Catholicism? Well, we got that name, if you know your history, the, the Byzantine Empire, you know, the, the, the Eastern Roman Catholic Empire, which is why I say it that way is because that is another different name that we, can, that, uh, we, are, that we use. It's be we're allowed to be called, you know, Eastern Roman Catholics, you know. So you have the Eastern you have the, Byzant uh, the Byzantine Empire, and that's where we came from, right? That's where we came up with our, our traditions, our ways, you know, that looks very differently from the Roman side, the, the, you know, the Western Roman Catholic Church, as sometimes it's called. So you, ha so you have that. Um, one of the biggest influences that I'll have to say was St. John Chrysostom. Uh, he is the one that we have our liturgy for. He wrote um, lots of books on commentaries on, if I, if I understand correctly, he wrote some on um, the Gospels, Matthew, and he wrote his, you know, his opinions on Matthew. He started our liturgy and there's some other things too that I uh, that I'm not real um, familiar with, but that's okay. If you guys want to know more about um, Saint John Chrysostom, I highly recommend it. He's a big uh, big influencer. He'll be a big influence in your own personal faith of his um, of his struggles. I do know that he was a um, a bishop, and that's when he started becoming. Now, if I understand correctly that there is a funny story that when he was becoming a bishop that he was actually terrified and he did he ran away if you knew that yeah he actually ran away that he did not want the responsibility and that he had to be like you know pretty much like taken back and be like you're going to get the responsibility of becoming a bishop and he didn't want it so he did take the um, he did assume responsibility and then he did become a bishop and then he became an influencer of the city, you know, and of um, Byzantine Catholicism. So, another thing I'd like to mention too, is that, you know, for about over 600 years, from the time of the Great Schism in 1054 to 1596, that um, we were in separation of Rome. We were Orthodox. And then in 1596, you had what is called the Union of Briest. And in the Union of Briest, where a lot of the Byzantine churches came together and became part of the Union of Rome. So as, as today in 2020, we are now, the Byzantine church is in communion with Rome, though you still have Byzantine Orthodox as well, who are not in communion with Rome. So if you went to a, uh, a Byzantine Catholic church and um, experienced divine liturgy, 
and then you went to a Byzantine Orthodox Church and experienced liturgy. It's practically the same, except you are not in communion with Rome. Also, the fact that if you're, if you're Catholic, you cannot take, um, you cannot partake in the Holy Eucharist. The, except if the if you you but you have to have permission with with the priest beforehand. So I want to make that clear. That would be the the differences in the you know between the Byzantine Catholics and the Byzantine Orthodox. So another differences with Byzantine Catholics is that there's so many different churches that is that is involved. I don't even know how many churches to be honest with you. I do know that there are the Ukrainian Greek Catholics, which I am a part of, our arch, our, we have our own patriarch, and then you have the Ruthenians, and they have their own patriarchs, and then so on and so forth. And that's very important to, um, to know what the patriarchs, because we answer to them. Not necessarily do we answer to the Pope of Rome. I want to know that's that that's a big distinction between Roman Catholics and the Eastern Catholics that we have our own patriarchs and we don't necessarily have to answer to the Pope of Rome we do our own thing now if there are issues if we have concerns then we might ask for his intercession but other than that the Pope is pretty much hands-off to all Eastern Catholic churches. Another big difference is that our priests are allowed to marry. And I know yeah. that that was kind of a big deal with this, uh, the Amazon Synod, yes. with, the, with, Roman, uh, with Roman Catholicism, with allowing priests, uh, Roman Catholic priests to marry. Um, in Byzantine and the Eastern Catholics, that's not really an issue. We're allowed, you know, the, the priests are, are allowed to marry and they're allowed to have children. And my priest is married and he, and he has um, one child. Now, the thing that, you, that is very important to know that they must do it before they take their vows. It's very important. And what also is interesting is that you can become a subdeacon if you're if you're not able to find you know a wife at that time, you can kind of stop the process of, of becoming a priest, just become subdeacon. And there's some that who thought they were called into the priesthood and they just kind of stop and they just stop at being a subdeacon and they're fine with that. Um, there are some in churches that will even will find you a wife. Now I know that's true in the Orthodox Church, and that is true in the Byzantine as well. That if you are a priest that wants to get married, the church will find a wife for you. So that, that's something to think about. Another cool thing that I would love to share is that in 2016 we had our very first, our very own catechism called Christ or Pascha. This deals with more of the traditions, of the Eastern traditions, than necessarily with um, laws and rules, though we do have our own, you know, we do have laws and rules that is in the catechism, but pretty much our laws and rules is no different really um, than Roman, you know, than the Roman Catholicism, except, you know, the little tweaks in here and there, you know, uh, but I find that really interesting that for, you know, thousands of years, hundreds of years, we did not have our own catechism until 2016, so that's pretty interesting if you want to look, at, um, look that up. You can find that on, you know, um, if you just type in Christ or Pascha, you'll find it and where to get it. Um, if there's any other questions that you have for me, John, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, I don't know that I necessarily have any questions. What about icons? Okay. Do um, you want to talk a little bit about icons? Because I notice, for example, whenever I've walked into a Byzantine church, I notice there are 
all kinds of icons, but is there like specific placement for certain icons? Like maybe the church is named after a specific saint. Would the icon go in a specific place? Or? That's a good question. That um, I'm that I'm not sure of. Though I will say that there are, you know, when you go into a Byzantine church, there are filled with icons as they should be. You know, it's no different than a. You know, a Roman Catholic Church having statues. Um, there should be statues in a Roman Catholic Church, and so there should be icons in a Byzantine church or an Eastern Catholic Church. There should there should be icons. Now, if there's a certain placement, I'm not sure of. However, if there is a feast day, that icon is displayed. Like for example, there was you know. Uh, what was it, a couple of weeks ago, we celebrated the Dormition of Our Lady. Which in the Roman Rite is called the Assumption. Right. Go ahead. No, actually, that's pretty good. I'm glad you, you mentioned that. That's another difference. The Assumption isn't in Roman Catholicism. In the Eastern Rite, we call it our, um, the Dormition of Our Lady. So, we, and we celebrate that. You know, we celebrate it as a, a, um, her, her funeral, basically. And what is in the center of the church is that icon of her dormition, which is very important. So when there's like feast days like that, or when you have Pascha, which is Easter, it's another difference. We don't say Easter, we say Pascha. When there is um, Pascha, we have our Lord, you know, risen um, for Fridays. We have him on the cross. So there's different, there's different icons for different reasons, and we will put them in the center for that. So does that answer your question? Yes, and actually in the center, um, there's like a little stand. Yes. Uh, and then the icon is displayed on the stand. Yes, on the stand. So um, I'll see if I can find a photo for that. Yes, and the main, are for us, our, the icon for that is the Theotokos, which is the Virgin Mary. That's another difference. We call her the Theotokos, which is Greek for God-bearer. So in that icon, she is holding, you know, uh, Jesus as a child, and there's in the center. And there are times where some will come up, do a cross, and will bless the icon. Nice, actually, I just re realized something. That's something we should talk about. We should talk about blessings when you bless yourself in the sign of the cross. Yeah, so I'll make the Roman sign of the cross, and you make your business yes. sign of the cross. So you Go ahead. See the difference. So notice we're opposite. Yes, and the, there's also another big difference, too. The Romans did the palm. You know what the palm is? The five wounds, Christ. We, the Eastern way, we do it this way. This three represents the Holy Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. With these two fingers are closed. This, these two fingers represents Christ's divinity and his humanity. So when you take those three fingers, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And that's how we bless. And that's something that um, I just realized, and that's something that is also a very important thing. If you ever, if Roman Catholics are ever interested, if you've never experienced um, Eastern Catholic churches, if you totally have no idea uh, what it's like, and you decide to come, that's something that you're going to realize. And how you bless, and that is, you know, we teach that to our children of how to to bless yourselves properly in the Eastern Catholic way. So that that was a good discussion. That was a good um, point that just came up. All right. Well, yeah, we could go on forever, but forever. I think um, maybe we'll see what questions the viewers have. If you have any questions, definitely post them in the comments. And if any Byzantine Catholics are watching, go ahead and feel free to answer those yes. questions. Or provide us with even more background. I mean, I'd absolutely love to hear more on this. So thank you so much, Peter. Thank you for having me. Thank you for watching, and everyone have a great day.